Hi everyone, James Lowe here, Music Director of the Spokane Symphony. Welcome to the first in a new series of podcasts where I'll be talking to musicians about their lives and work through the lens of some of their favourite music and lifting the lid a little on the performer's world. At the time of this recording, we are all locked down due to the coronavirus and all out of work. I would never have expected to see such a difficult period in my lifetime, and I hope that you are all well and safe. This is a perilous time for all arts institutions, as we rely on income from performances and events to stay afloat. The SSO have set up an emergency relief fund for our musicians, some of whom will even fall through the cracks of the new CARE Act. So if you love the SSO and live music, And if our work has somehow touched you in the past years, I would appeal to you to consider a donation to them or to the orchestra at large via our website, www.spokansymphony.org. It's not all doom and gloom, though. I'm holed up at home and here we have just taken in a new puppy called Humphrey. Humph is keeping us very much on our toes. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, although I'm not a regular twit, well, that's arguable. Um, you may even catch a glimpse of him. My handle for both of these is at low murmurs. That's at sign L O W E M U R M U R S. And of course, be sure to follow the symphony at Spokane Symphony. Mateusz Wolski has been the concertmaster of the Spokane Symphony for about 12 years. Any regular to the orchestra will know what a big personality he is and how he very much goes against the grain when it comes to the myth that all classical musicians are boring and serious. He's the mastermind, or perhaps evil genius, behind The M Show, a live event which mixes music with comedy, video, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. He races cars, he has a Lotus, and is generally an important and irrepressible part of our community. We talk about the impact of the current crisis on our daily lives, but also more generally about the importance of live music, his background in Poland, and what we think about the relationship between conductors and orchestra. I hope you enjoy this chat recorded on April the 2nd, 2020. Okay, Mateusz Wolski. Jen Dobry, Jen Dobry, good morning. How are you doing? Jen Dobry, Jen Dobry. Um, I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Maestro Low? I'm, I'm great. That is, thanks for the maestro. That is literally the, ex- the entirety of my Polish. So we'll have to do the rest in English. Uh, sounds very good. You know, you have to bear my accent, so things are even. <laughs> I think we both score pretty high on the accent stakes, to be honest. So tell me, where are you right now and what, what are you doing? Uh, I'm in Spokane, Washington, huddled with my family in their house, trying not to go out um, too often. Essentially, right now, uh, you know, we are in the quarantine times here due to uh, coronavirus. So we've been trying to be very good at um, obeying kind of the social distancing orders. So I'm kind of the only one that goes out to go get us groceries and I'm trying to be diligent to, you know, not to bring anything back home. So there are cleaning procedures and all of that kind of just things that you never thought you would, you would be doing. But I guess the diligence of being a musician so far paid off and it seems like uh, we're, we're holding up pretty good. So yeah, so that's the, so that's the reality here. What about, you, uh, what about yourself? Well, it's kind of the same. I mean, I've never scrubbed a jar of marmalade before in my life. This whole concept of social distancing is you know, really interesting for musicians, of course, because our entire life is dedicated to the, the exact opposite. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, or the, the be, being connected with each other, I think that's the whole point of playing music, live music particularly. And even when you record something, you know, you're kind of sort of trying to connect with somebody with your, uh, uh, with your performance and, and the message. So this definitely is, is hard times, I think, for creatures like us. I think you're right. And what I find really incredible about classical music is how you can kind of step inside the mind and the emotions of someone long dead essentially you know and we're going to be talking a little bit about the Tchaikovsky violin concerto which which you and I are supposed to be performing in a in a week or two's time uh, yeah. and now we're not which is which is really sad 
but for me, the thing I love the most about classical music is not only the connection of the musicians on stage and to the live audience, but this kind of almost mystical connection back to someone who's no longer around. Yeah, you know, I was um, thinking about this, that, you know, they, the way we are trying to learn about people that are long dead, that then maybe uh, they died, be- died before this amazing technology where you can do videos and podcasts and, and stuff like that. How can we get to know them? What kind of people were there? If the only kind of information we have is the letters that they wrote, maybe they wrote a memoir, but that gives you kind of a lot of rudimentary information. But what was really deep side, deep inside their souls? Uh, very hard to find. But I, I, I feel, and I know we shared that the sentiment that when you listen to someone's music, you really get a window to what kind of person are they uh you know would you like to go to a bar and have a beer with them or were you know or were somebody that you admire but from afar yeah you know i actually have a list in my head of of composers i want to have a beer with <laughs> so you, you know do. i think i do like <laughs> so i think Dvor- dvorak would be a great guy to go with go for a beer with you know i think he'd be a fun guy uh wagner mm, maybe maybe not so much I imagine that if I met Tchaikovsky, we would we would be spending hours talking about art and the world, and and I think I would like to become friends with him, honestly, uh, and actually knowing today uh, what he struggled with, you know, his kind of uh, uh, sexual identity and stuff like that. He struggled a great deal with that aspect of his life, and he for sure needed friends and some people that he could trust to um to. Um, to be able to express this, I think, besides writing this into his music. So so I, I think it's, it adds as, as a very fascinating uh, facet to why would you like to spend the time with somebody and get to know them. He had to be so buttoned up in real life that all of this incredible passion was put into his music you know it's a bit of a kind of a, a basic and pretty anodyne theory but uh, I really feel that this man who was so careful and guarded in his life, his music is is exactly the opposite of that. I would draw a parallel to our lives right now, just as careful as we have to be coming back from the grocery store and cleaning our, you know, purchases and stuff, trying to to scrub them off a virus. I almost feel like I I can put myself into the into the mind of like you watch your every step because you don't want to get sick. You don't want to get your loved one sick. And in his case, it's, I mean, he did, doesn't want to tarnish his or his friend's reputation. So I think that living uh, in that kind of fear and then, yeah, where, 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 where are the places where you can kind of take the lid off and be yourself? Uh, you know, in my house, that we do dance parties and stuff that you definitely don't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you do, you, do, you do things that, yeah, you probably would not want anybody else to to see or witness, you want them to be private, but yeah, in, in, I guess when you're a composer, uh, you can definitely put it into into the music, and um, you know, it, it's it's I don't know, it seems like always the the, the great ones uh, and great composers and great compositions always come from that place of oppression or tragedy or or something that creates or forces the life to be different than normal, and that somehow quite often yields amazing treasures in in art for for the rest of the world and i think it's some expense of the of the struggles of a of a of a maker so you you kind of subscribe to the idea that i think i agree with as well actually that in some way suffering is a bit of a prerequisite you need to have suffered a bit in order to create great art do you think that's the case well i think the the art generally um represents or and where we are drawn to to art i think it represents some sort of extraordinary state of a human being i think that um person going about their own happy normal life you know uh just 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 doing daily routines uh it's it's not something that i think is fascinating or interesting to to regular people unless you know we're talking about celebrities like kardashians the the moment when things get interesting uh, it's kind of like a new cycle. It's either when something like really, really bad happens or something truly great happens. And I think that 
the life typically provides a lot more opportunities in a crisis rather than, than jubilation or some sort of extraordinary uh, joyful you know happen events in someone's life so 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 I think the, the frequency of appearance you know of this, this kind of heightened human condition when you're either celebrating some sort of a great victory or or you're dealing with some big tra tragedy you have a lot more tragedies so therefore that provides you this this extraordinary state of, of creation and then and then you you're trying to express the the emotion that comes with this either to to capture your emotional state or offer the alternative or counterpoint to what is happening in the world around you I think you're absolutely right. Actually, I want to share something with you that we, we, we haven't spoken about before, which was my first experience of going to Poland, which is obviously, really? if anybody listening doesn't know, is, is your home country. Um, yes. My first experience going to Poland was, was really profound and it stayed with me. It would have been 19, I think, 95 or 96. So, you know, not not that long after the kind of fall of communism. I mean, a long time in, in some ways, but in terms of societal change, I guess it, it, it still felt very, very different from, from the UK where I grew up. And I went there on tour with my university string orchestra, which I conducted. And we did one concert in the middle of nowhere. And don't ask me where it was. It's somewhere near Krakow. And it was in this little chapel in this little town, little village. And when we went there, I thought, oh, come on, why, what are we doing a gig here for? You know, it's a beautiful, it's a cl a cloisters or something, an old, um, uh, an old monastery, I think it was. And, and we're in this chapel and I kind of thought, oh, you know, why are we here? There's this t tiny village, nobody's going to come. Anyway, we did the rehearsal. And then in the evening, it was packed, absolutely packed to the rafters. It was our first concert there. People crammed in, sit, kneeling at the front, the kids and, and adults standing at the back. And I have never played in my life until that moment for an audience who received that music with such joy and real gratitude. And it, it was incredibly profound for me, you know, because in the UK, we'd, we'd play for people and they'd be very polite and say, yes, that's very nice. Very, very good. But this experience of mine in Poland, I suddenly felt he, here are people who really music it means something very, very deep to these people uh, and that's something that stayed with me ever since is that something you kind of feel is true about poland you know it's fascinating i i, I think uh, because i have a story for you that you probably also didn't hear uh about my experience in england and it, it's <laughs> roughly exactly around the same time as, as as yours uh and and it was um before I answer your question, let me, let me tell you the story, which was I was uh, in, uh, with my uh, string quartet. It was called the Elsner String Quartet. We're a young kind of hotshot, upcoming string quartet that essentially will brought me to the States later on. But yeah, it must have been, um, oh my goodness, 94, 95, maybe. And, um, and we had a residency at Britain Pierce School. And uh, we went in to, to uh, you know, um, uh, to play a series of concerts for, for six weeks uh, in the, you know, uh, on a, uh, what is it? Is it the Eastern Seaboard for you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, anyway so, so, so towns on the coast. And to me, what was absolutely amazing, we are going to go play one of the, the, the great uh, standard repertoire concerts with Mozart, Beethoven and stuff. And all of a sudden, there's this small church. And there is like first two rows, it's, it's 50 people with the scores in their hands, <laughs> <laughs> listening, to, listening to everything we play. And then you think, oh boy, <laughs> now, now they know every wrong note that I play. <laughs> oh <laughs> no. So, yeah, the, 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 well, you know, of course, you're a young, young musician, that's kind of like what you think, you know, it's like because you're aspiring to be like super great. So now, but it was this this tremendous respect and, and interest in in the in, in trying to understand what that whole music is about and appreciate its beauty not only because it sounds great but actually trying to understand and, I, and that gave me a really a pause to 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 see that music can be appreciated in so many different ways you know because we have our own biases so um, going back to your story I think that Polish people are. I would say 
historically speaking, if we can generalize, are a kind of people who uh, wear their hearts on their sleeve. They're very, very kind of open, and um, and, and they, they, you know, they're not quite as loud as Italians, but I would say that we're much closer to like kind of Italians rather than German. So the places where you can experience um, a great art and we can kind of get into it. That is definitely a place where, where you're going to find Polish people uh, generally drawn very much uh, into it and they will express their enthusiasm greatly. And I think also at a time uh, where probably when you visited, also anything that is that was made in the West, including people who, uh, who grew up in the West, uh, there was tremendous hunger to try to get to know them and, and see what a person that grew up in a, you know, a, a free country what do they what do they sound like what do they think like what do they feel like because we've been oppressed for so many years so in some ways i think there was a great deal of hunger to try to kind of capture that sense that hey i know somebody that that lived their life uh, and they were free uh, because now we are free too so you know we kind of right now finally are on the same page i've always loved poland i've always loved working there and i'm i'm a big fan of of bison grass vodka so <laughs> Yes, I was just going to tell you, Żubrówka with, uh, with, uh, with the apple juice. That's the, that's the national Polish drink. Were your parents musicians? You know, it's actually really quite fascinating because, no, uh, my dad is a very prolific writer who has a uh, almost, he's, I mean, sometimes we joke that he's a walking Google. I mean, if you start to quiz him on the music history, uh, he's going to test out much better than I ever could. However, he cannot carry a tune, and um, and for him the music uh, is kind of like a, a side dish uh, to life. So he accepts music as a as a backdrop. He doesn't ever consider music as a main course, which we we had a lot of conversations uh, about through the years. But but that is his sensibility. So I mean, it's really quite fascinating for him the word, the story. It's it's what um what is important, the message. Uh, my mom, on the other hand, uh, she, she actually was a, a pianist through high school, and eventually she uh, she had to kind of make a make a choice whether she would like to go into something uh, non artistic. So so she has a doctorate in biology, and she worked as a researcher, and then she has me and my sister, so she just kind of took a hiatus. Uh, but I think it's her side of the family where the really music comes from. Uh, my grandfather was never formally trained, but he was amazing at improvising on the piano and was self-taught and just pretty much could pick up any tune and kind of sit down and, and, and monkey around with it. And, and, and he sounded great. So I remember as a little kid that, that he would be kind of the life of a party uh, where people would gather. So so no, so the, so the kind of the music was uh, a place I was, uh, as a child, I used to just bang around things, bang around the piano we had at home. And, uh, and generally uh, was pretty active kid. So my mom, the way she says it, I, I kept running into things. It's a lot of cuts and bruises and she figured out that, she, that kid needs some sort of a coordination. And when we got a letter from, from the music school to, to, to go get tested, if, if, I would, if I would be compatible with the musical training, she's like, you know, let's send him to the music school. Maybe he will get some sort of coordination. So he, you know, he will live to an adulthood. So that essentially what happened, and then uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, yeah, it was a very practical choice on my mom's uh, part, and and you know, and then I got into it, and and actually the aspect of playing chamber music, playing with with other musicians, was something that really actually kept me going. You know, every young musician has those moments where you you think, should I stay or should I go? I mean, should I quit music and get onto something else, or? Is there something more that I want to explore? And, and in my case, every single time, pretty much, uh, something that, that brought me back into playing was was playing with other people, playing with other musicians. And also, you know, I figured out that was the thing that came the most natural to me, uh, as opposed to, you know, regular schoolwork. <laughs> I'll mentor that one. I, I had a similar experience, although music didn't really cure me of my clumsiness i still can i can still find every table table leg with my kneecap quite quite easily um, i just want to maybe touch a little bit on this idea of chamber music versus orchestral music do you think 
with a chamber music background, you have a slightly different approach to being a concert master? I would say that, you know, the the way I view it after, you know, being a concert master with Spokane Symphony for 12 years, I think, I think that ultimately playing in the orchestra is, is no different uh, than playing a chamber music. The, the challenge uh, really or the difference is how many how many moving pieces you're trying to coordinate at the same time and uh, it's almost like right now we are living in a reality when you're trying to have conferences uh, with a number of people uh, via software like Zoom and you know that there is only a certain amount of bandwidth that is available to you before the things are starting to crash and, um, and I think that for uh, a, a kind of a normal uh, person managing kind of information string that comes from you from a quartet, sextet, well, octet. It's something that uh, you, you can kind of process that and play your instrument at the same time. When you scale it up to the size of the orchestra, when you have 70, 80 musicians on stage and trying to coordinate that stuff, you know, that's that's what it really becomes a, a, a really fun challenge in some ways. Uh, when you when you when you're trying to really connect and, and, and play with all of those people, and and I think that's that's the moment where you you figure out that you run out of your RAM in your brain and uh, and you really need some sort of uh, external help, and that's where you step in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad you I'm glad you think of me as a help, <laughs> not an entrance. Actually, this is. What... This is why I love working with Matej, because I, I totally agree with you. I think there's something very often that I've noticed that is kind of dangerous, which is that you put four musicians together without a conductor and the music flows and it goes back and it's free and people listen and people respond and it's alive. Somehow you put a whole group of 30, 40 people, and I don't know what the kind of cutoff is, but there's certainly a number of people. And something happens where somehow it gets a little stiff again, a little mattered, a little... That spontaneity can easily go. My my entire approach to conducting and to making music is that all music is chamber music. And that, that like you say, there are so many moving parts, but, but my job is to help the musicians to be free rather than to impose this iron will on the orchestra so that you do everything that in my wonderful maestro mind have conceived. I don't think of it like that at all. I think of myself as a, well, the clue's in the name. You're a conductor. You're conducting this electricity right. from person to person. You're not, you're not, you're not actually the source of anything. You are just conducting what the composer wrote. You're conducting what the musicians are doing in front of you. I think all music is chamber music. You know, what is the, the quest, quite fascinating um, thing that kind of goes through my head these days because there's a you know the challenge that humanity is facing right now. It's a it's a huge actually test of leadership and between different countries, different people manage those things better or worse without getting into details. But you know there are certain quotes that are floating around, and uh, and one of them, and I'm not going to be exact, but essentially that the, the whole concept of a uh, when a great leader does things well, then everybody thinks that they achieved the success. Uh, they don't even notice that the, the, the person who leads them actually just simply allows them to do the work well. Uh, and and when the things go bad, then the great leaders take responsibility and they say, hey, my bad, um, let, let's try to do it again. And I find that the same thing, uh, a trace of a, a great conductor is, uh, is, is, is something that musicians almost forget that he's on the podium because the th things are going so well and they are so relaxed and they just kind of connect with each other. They don't realize that the conductor is, is kind of a conduit for making them comfortable with, with, with everybody on the stage and therefore free to express and play the music well. So, um, so, you know, so this is a really quite fascinating concept because to the, you know, to the audience, it looks like, oh, you know, the musicians are probably, I don't know, are like completely fearful of the conductor or, uh, are they so in love with him or, you know, what is the relationship? But I think it's, it's really ultimately at the end of the day is, uh, when you create a situation where it's just so comfortable, you forget that the conductor is there, uh, then that's when the magic happens. 
I totally agree with you. And you're exactly right. That's where the magic happens. My old teacher is a Finnish guy called Jorma Panola. And his mantra is help, but don't get in the way. And interestingly, this philosophy, I think, goes actually all the way back, at least to ancient China. If you read Lao Tse and apologize for mangling the name, Zhang Tsi, I think. Zhang Tsi, I apologize to people who know about these things. But there's this idea of the leader leading without a trace. I was thrilled to discover that my great, great hero, Carlos Kleiber, who I think was the greatest conductor who ever lived, he was obsessed with this Chinese philosophy and he had the same thought. There's actually a wonderful documentary about him and the title of it is Kein Spur Hinterlassen, Leave Behind No Traces. It always strikes me that musicians are <clears throat> perhaps a little slow to praise conductors <laughs> and quite rightly so. But but the one positive comment you hear everywhere you go, when you ask about a good conductor, they say, yeah, 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 he, she's very good. They don't get in the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I think that the, uh, the whole challenge of something like a symphony orchestra in a construct uh, were kind of built like uh, like your country with the monarchy in place, and, um, <laughs> and gener- <laughs> it's generally people don't to modern people especially don't like the concept that there is somebody that is considered superior to them and and tells them what to do. Except in our reality, you know, that is actually still the most efficient way how to bring um, music. I mean, bring musicians and get the job done of of putting the concert on together. So uh, it's a compromise that I think uh, musicians are willing to accept, but a lot of them are not going to like it. <laughs> no. Well, I have to say it's also why why I really, really dislike them, the M word, maestro, because for me it puts the conductor in a position that is, as you say, somehow above like some kind of monarch above the orchestra. And I think that isn't really how it worked at all. You are the channel for something. You're the vessel for something. No, but you, but you know, Hans, let me, let me push back on this. Let me push back on this whole maestro thing. Uh, because, I mean, yeah, we keep joking always uh, for some of uh, people that are listening to it. Yeah, the first thing that James said when we started working together would be, you know, whatever you do, don't call me maestro, which to me, of course, presents a challenge. So whenever I can, I call uh, James maestro just to get a <laughs> kick out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> no, but, but you see, I think that the the fascinating thing, especially we started working together, you know, right now it's been a year and change. And that was after an exhaustive music director search for the orchestra. To me, what was incredibly eye-opening through that for a period is how much that guy waving the stick in front of us without saying a word, how much difference it makes in the way how we sound and how we trust each other. And and then the smallest little element, whether it's something that they say, they do, they smile, they, they look at you, uh, can completely affect how the orchestra sounds. I mean, it, it's kind of like unbelievable. Because you, you you would think that you're not you're not supposed to be affected this much by such a small subtle things, so so actually, I think that it doesn't matter how they think about themselves, but they're actually input into what comes out out of a group of people. It has a very profound effect. So in 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 some sense, the the combination of factors that make the conductor compatible with the orchestra, finding somebody that is that has this, this unique number of attributes you know it's 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 quite quite special so there is an element you have to recognize that somebody who who is chosen to to lead they they do deserve a name not maybe because of their hard work or good looks or even fancy accent but there's something (laughs) although i do have all of those (laughs) yes there you go Uh, um, but there's now but there's something that that is is, uh, makes them uniquely fit to, uh, to to be a conductor and you know and I don't think that conductor uh, as a generic word quite captures what the credit that is due because at the end of the day I mean there is something that it almost in our minds also we need to create something that is greater than a, than a person in order to feel 
confident that in the heat of the battle of playing very difficult work, that we can rely on that person if the things go sideways, because they do sometimes. And you know that you need somebody to hold all the strands together and you need to trust them and know that we'll be okay on the other end. Well, I would definitely say that the match in personality between a conductor and an orchestra is incredibly important. And in all honesty, it's rare to find a really good fit. I feel absolutely like I found my musical tribe with the Spokane Symphony. I genuinely feel this is this is an orchestra, you know, we breathe the same way and and it's just so much fun to make music with you guys. Let's go back a little bit to Tchaikovsky, because the whole point of this is we're supposed to be talking about Tchaikovsky. I had a feeling you and I may get a little <laughs> off topic. What was your first encounter with the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto? Ah, uh, so this, it's, it's actually a very funny story. Uh, so my aunt, she's much younger than my dad. She, she's the sisters with my dad, but she's 16 years younger. So in some ways, when I was growing up, she was almost like my older sister and she was actually going to the music school she she is a fabulous percussionist today she lives in the, uh, Basel Switzerland has a uh, um, a very very extensive new music career I mean, I mean she performs a lot of things that are essentially John Cage and newer to, to which we we uh, we have a lot of fascinating debates when she calls me ah you know the the, the old composers that are boring you know the, <laughs> Let's do some, if you want to play something, play some new music. So, so but at the topic for another conversation. Uh, when I was a, uh, a little little kid, she had a record player, and I remember that she was like, "Oh, you know, there's this great piece of music," and I'm, I think I might be maybe five or six years old, and I still have that memory of her putting on the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. And I was just screaming bloody web murder of like, I don't want to listen to this. This is horrible. Uh, you know, don't make me, you know, and I was just, I was just, you know, she was trying to have me try something. And of course, to me, that was like, uh, heck no, I'm not doing this. But maybe that early exposure to this ended up circling back and then uh, make, made me re-examine that when I, when I got a little older. Uh, what I really truly like, and, and and it's really fun because I remember that, that the very first piece that I actually was sort of made to listen was the Tchaikovsky Ballet Concerto, and and I think also it might have been the time that when I went to the music school for the first time in Poland they would assign you an instrument you didn't choose it they they did a bunch of tests on you your your rhythm your your ear and this and that and then they say okay you should, you are going to play violin. And I was devastated by that decision because we had a piano at home and I wanted to play piano. So, so I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is how this whole thing connected and, and sent me on this path that uh, made me who I am today. And that's, well, that's why we're having this conversation. Yeah, so how's the violin working out for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say at this junction, um, at least I have something that, that I can do at home uh, in the times of uh, great um, distress. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, current reality is such that the very purpose of playing music and, and live and connecting people and bringing them together uh, kind of defies the, the way how we are trying to, to get rid, rid of this pandemic. So yeah, so it's, it's a little hard to, uh, to realize that something that you took for granted for the time being, essentially, it's, it's, uh, you're not allowed to not only make your living, but actually uh, follow your vocation. So, so that's a little, so that's a little challenging. And then, of course, there's a fear: what's going to happen uh, on the other side of things? Because we all know that one way or another, humanity is going to find a way how to uh, 
you know, diminish the effects of the virus, but what the world is going to look like in in few months or a few years, uh, it's anybody's guess. And and musicians are all kind of thinking, hey, is this is is is, is that is that kind of the end of the road for the art form that's been with us for such a long time, or are we going to find a way how to how to make the music again, and we all will wake up on that day and feel that this was all a really, really bad dream. Humanity is certainly changing right now. I think this music has, has survived for so long because it is relevant. What, say, Tchaikovsky writes in his Violin Concerto, those emotions and those those feelings and those shades of emotions, because it's not just like happy or sad, uh, it's uh-huh. this it's complicated emotions. These speak to people because they're still real. The emotions are real. The, the the things that are going on around us are very, very different from his time, but the emotions that he felt are analogous with things that we have now. Occasionally, you know, when you're walking along a sidewalk and you see a little daisy has somehow broken through the concrete, that always looks like such a hopeful thing to me. Uh, and you think, God, oh, this little, little flower can break through such a hard unyielding substance i think there's something in humanity that will bring this back i actually can't wait for the moment when we can all play music again in a big group together because i think that is going to be one of i think the one of the most profoundly moving and exciting moments of my life i i think you know this the old saying uh the absence may may your makes your heart, heart grow fonder I think that um, very likely this is what's going to happen that because we kind of miss congregating together and and, uh, playing music together, going to the concerts, doing social things, I think that there will be a great hunger for that type of connection that we're all being denied for the time being. And hopefully that will, you know, make us not only appreciate, but, but realize that there's a tremendous value in that kind of freedom of doing things as opposed to being cooked up in your, in your own home and, you know, Netflix and other streaming things can only go so far to entertain you. And, and I think at the, at, the, at the end of the day, you feel somehow a little hollow when you're disconnected from, from other human beings, larger groups. So this is, in, in some ways, it might be a very telling experiment where humanity is today and how much this kind of love with technology and progress when when this reality hits uh, how much of that can can really truly fulfill like the genuine need of human beings to connect and is the substitution of having podcasts over the internet as opposed to being in person uh or having virtual performances you know how much of how much of that is uh, can can fill the void can it replace it or is it, is it like all making us feel like this doesn't feel right this is not enough and uh, we need to, we need to, we need to be together in the one place and uh, and do things the, in the old-fashioned way of, of being face to face and enjoying uh, life as you know, as a community, as opposed to individuals stuck in the little in the little pods. Again, I I would totally agree with you. This is a very boring podcast because we are pretty much agreeing on everything. <laughs> I know, I know. Come on, say something controversial. <laughs> Maestro. <laughs> uh, there we go. That's it. <laughs> <Son of a. laughs> no, I was just going to say, as, as just the last thing to talk about, I guess you also must be missing driving very, very fast in circles. Yeah, I, no, no, I, I'm, I do not prescribe to American NASCAR. I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, driving in circles is not racing. Uh, no, you, no, going through the corners. No, you know, it's actually, so for, again, for some people who are not familiar, um, uh, my kind of a hobby when I don't play uh, music is to, to, to race my uh, little Lotus Elise, it's a little race car, British by the way, that, that, I, that I compete in the autocross events, which are solo races against the clock. And, uh, and essentially, whoever can get through a course uh, without hitting cones that are set that lay out the course on like an airport runway, whoever can do that fastest, the fastest without hitting the cones, that that person wins. So it's a very technical, very fun, and yet quite approachable and uh, non non dangerous motorsport. So yeah, I cannot I cannot do that right now. There's a lot of 
friends of mine that belong to a local club and everybody's grumbling because normally the season starts at the beginning of April and it looks like we're not going to have a season. The, the other reality is that somewhere in the middle of the winter, I started to take my car apart to replace a transmission for uh, one that is slightly stronger and yada, yada, yada. So my car currently sits in the garage, half disassembled, and somehow I thought that, you know, okay, fine, pandemic is coming. I will have so much time on my hands. It seems that I'm busier than ever. So, uh, so the, yeah, the, the car is still in pieces, and um, the reality is, too, that both me and my wife are trying to um, to work by yeah, kind of, uh, you know, she, my, my wife, who is a uh, general director of uh, Inland Northwest Opera, she's trying to keep her opera company kind of alive through this storm. You know, I'm the consumer of Spokane Symphony, so I'm trying to... to uh, lend a hand wherever I can to uh, to keep our orchestra visible and uh, and floating till this is all over. Plus, you know, we still teach, and then we have a four year old at home that we have no babysitters for. So there's a constant juggling of like, okay, honey, can you play with him and uh, you know uh, work? And you know, and we we don't want to be those parents that just put him on a on on TV because those are very formative years right now. So interaction and teaching him stuff. And, uh, and and doing things together, uh, I think are super super important. So so yes, all of a sudden we are just as busy as, as during our regular season, and I have not been able to touch my race car at all. So it's kind of it, it's kind of uh, crazy how even in the, in this kind of situations uh, we cannot seem to find a way how to just uh, kick back and relax. You know, but that's life. I was looking forward to a bit of Netflix sitting around in my underpants all day long, but that's really not happened to me yet. I, Like you, I've been hugely busy with all manner of things. I mean, I'm not least trying to keep the symphony going and afloat and finding a way of, of steering the ship through this time, you know, when we essentially have absolutely no revenue coming in whatsoever, but our bills still still need to be paid. You know, the big challenge or big motivator is you have this performance of coming um uh, you know in a month two or three so you kind of schedule your um your work or uh, based on that that goal you know climb that mountain and right now we all of a sudden find ourselves with yeah not seeing any mountains on the horizon and we are walking through this desert and we don't know where how long do we have to go and do we have enough water that's uh that's kind of the the, the challenge but you know, we'll just keep on uh, walking till we find some oasis, hopefully, and and then we, we we start to see some mountain ranges again that we can climb. Here's to the mountain and Matej Volsky. Thank you so much. It's always a joy to talk to you, and I simply can't wait to be back on stage making music with you again. Thank you so much. Ah, likewise. Thank you, James. Thank you, Maestro. <laughs> That was my conversation with Mateusz Wolski, concertmaster of the Spokane Symphony, recorded on April 2nd, 2020. It was always such a pleasure to chat with Mateusz, and that was really just the kind of nonsense we talk about over dinner. Thanks, as always, for your kind support of the orchestra, especially during these most difficult times. As I mentioned at the top of the podcast, we are currently raising money for our Musicians Relief Fund and the annual fund which keeps our organisation afloat. If you love live music in Spokane, please consider a donation, no matter how small. Until next time, stay safe and well, and keep your eye on the SSO Facebook page, Instagram, and our website for more content from us.
wonderful Benjamin Bileman there performing Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto with the Spokane Symphony under the direction of Eckhart Proy, taken from a live performance in March 2017. Grateful thanks to Jim Tevenon of KPBX for his help with this podcast. <laughs>